Hello everyone. This is our first video for this course in the prison epistles. I have taught two other online courses, or rather one course twice for Multnomah on the um, patristic theology and medieval theology, but we didn't do any videos. This is my first foray into doing videos for these courses, so I hope, hope they're profitable. My goal is to keep them to, you know, 10, 15, 18 minutes. We'll see how well I do at that. As a pastor, I regularly tell people that, oh, I have a short sermon this Sunday, and it turns out not to be short. So we'll see what happens here. Prison epistles, four letters. We're going to cover them in the order of Colossians, Ephesians, excuse me, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, Philippians, a total of 15 chapters. And I'm excited about this. I've been studying this for a couple months now, and they're going to be phenomenal. We cannot cover every paragraph. We'll hit on the main areas of theology that interest me and the areas of practical Christian living that flow from that theology. There's a lot here. You may have picked different passages than I would pick, but I'm the teacher. I get to do it. As I break down these passages, we will not necessarily follow Moo's outline in his textbook. Um, you're going to read each letter four times, as we talked about in the syllabus, but Moo's outlines may be a little different than mine, and it shouldn't cause confusion. But I want to start with a passage from Colossians, since that's our first book we're going to cover, a passage that drives my ministry. I've been a pastor for 28 years and have struggled with what it means to make disciples. So there's a passage in Colossians starting in chapter 1, verse 24 to 29, and really, 28, 29 is the key, but I want to read you the whole paragraph. So, so let me read that to you. i got to toggle things around on my computer here, so as I look down or away, don't, don't get distracted. But Paul says this, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I could do a lot of commentary here. I'm not exactly sure what it means here when he says, I fill up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Maybe that's something one of you guys can run down and share with the class. But as Paul goes on, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, and here we get to the point, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And here's the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So not just in Jewish believers, but in all believers, Gentile and Jewish, Christ resides in us. And this is the mystery, and it's the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, verse 28, him we proclaim. And here's the crux of the matter for me as a pastor and for this course. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So that phrase there, to present everyone mature in Christ. The word mature there is the Greek word teleos. The New American Standards translates it can present every man complete in Christ. The NIV 1984 translation says present every man perfect in Christ. We tend to use the word perfect differently as absolutely no flaw. Would you see a difference between mature and perfect? I think mature can be this idea of reaching a level of, of Christ-likeness, but not perfection. The word can be translated mature. In fact, Jesus uses this word in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That kind of is my King James coming out in me. Be ye perfect. The 2011 NIV translated fully mature. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to see this word again, where Paul talks about the fact that that he has not reached this maturity. He strives for it. He presses on to grab hold of that for which he was grabbed hold of by Christ to be mature. So this is what drives me in my ministry to make sure that in the role I play in people's lives as a pastor and a teacher, 
that my goal is to move them forward in this maturity. And this maturity, I would say in Galatians 4.19 is described in a different way. Galatians 4.19, Paul says to them, I'm in labor again because they've fallen away from the gospel. I'm in labor again till Christ is formed in you. So the idea of becoming like Christ, Christ dwells in us and we're becoming like Christ. He is being formed in us. That's the goal of the Christian life is to have Christ formed in us, to become mature. Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to see this in a few weeks, that before the foundation of the world, world, God appointed us to be holy and blameless before him. That's the goal. So we'll get there. We'll get there. So the first one, the passage that drives me is this Colossians 1, 28 and 29 specifically, that I want to spend my life and my ministry so that I can see in the people I minister to a growing Christ-likeness. So someday, as Paul does for the Colossians, that whoever I have the opportunity to minister to and the responsibility to minister to, I can see them presented as mature before Christ. So that's the passage that drives my ministry. Now I want to give you the concept that drives me. This is, this is new in the last six or seven years of my ministry, is I've been thinking about what kind of disciples are we making in the church? And, and these prison epistles are going to directly address this concern of mine. That's why I'm bringing it to you now. And, and remember, we, remember when we approach the Bible, we tend to approach it with our own cultural biases, our own, our own concerns in life. We have our own questions that we seek answers for as we read Scripture. Ideally, we should be... Um, somewhat blank slates, which is technically impossible. But here's what a concept that I'm seeing everywhere in the New Testament now. And so I, I filter my reading through this. And my teaching through these prison epistles, well, you'll see this over and over again. The concept that drives me is this. Salvation is not simply an event. It is a process. Okay. Let me say it again. Salvation is not simply an event. It is a process. We often ask, hey, when did you get saved? And for me, it was in April 1979. I got saved. And that very statement sounds definitive. I'm fully saved. And, and, and there's a sense where that's true. But there's a very much sense where it's not true. I'm not fully saved yet. Let, let me explain more. If we went back to the Reformation, we would see the Reformation, what came out of the Reformation was the teaching that salvation is broken up into three steps. First, your justification. You were declared righteous. You, you, you professed your faith in Christ. You accepted him, whatever terminology you want to use, and you were justified, declared righteous. Then the next step of your salvation is this idea of sanctification, where you're growing in this righteousness. And then last is your glorification when Christ returns, raises us from the dead, and we are fully like Jesus in every way, perfect, without sin. Well, over time, this has become simplified, especially in our desire to present a gospel message that is, is concise and quick. We've simplified it. And, and the evangelistic crusades of the last hundred years have caused us to do this also that we want to present a gospel in just a few minutes. And what we end up doing is saying, okay, come forward, or if it's in a living room, you're playing with a friend, say this prayer. So we give them the sinner's prayer. And then we assure them, now that you've said this prayer, assuming you meant it, you're now forgiven. And you get to go to heaven someday when you die. So we've reduced salvation to this event in the past where you're forgiven, in this hope of the future where you go to heaven when you die. And the in-between time has seems to have become optional, what we would call sanctification. What I want to do, and that's, that's, that's also what I call the truncated gospel. It, it becomes, what it does is it turns Jesus into a distributor of benefits. Come to Jesus, you'll be forgiven, and you'll go to heaven someday. Those are the benefits you get. In between time, you just live your life normally, you pray to him, you read your Bible, you, you go to Bible study, you go to church when you can. And, and no one says it this way, but we tend to say, and all those things are secondary to that initial salvation when you said the prayer of forgiveness, and that glorification when you go to heaven when you die. Those things are certain. The in-between time, somewhat optional. 
Again, no one says it that way, but that's the way it seems to be taken these days. I call this the in-between time. We tend to base the assurance of our salvation on the past event. So let me unpack those two things. The in-between time. This in-between time that tends to be seen as optional is actually what the majority of the New Testament addresses. Most of the things we're going to read in Paul's letters, these, this Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon, address this in-between time, how to grow in maturity. And when we say our assurance of salvation is pay, based upon a past event, so if someone's doubting their salvation, one of the first things a pastor might say to them is, well, have you received Christ? Have you said the sinner's prayer? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? And if you say yes, they'll say, well, then you're saved. Don't worry about it. Well, that's, that's not entirely correct. So before I go further, though, understand, I believe in eternal security. I prefer the phrase, the perseverance of the saints. I very much do not like the phrase, once saved, always saved. That implies something that we don't mean. But eternal security, or preferably the perseverance of the saints, there's a call upon you to persevere, to keep the faith. What did Paul say in 2 Timothy 4 at the end of his life? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You see, Paul puts certainty of salvation, the assurance of salvation, on Am I currently keeping the faith? Am I currently walking with Jesus? Am I, or as John would say, am I abiding in Christ? Not, did you say a prayer for me 40, 43 years ago? That is scary. 43 years ago. That's the emphasis we're going to see in these letters. We're going to see not that there isn't assurance we can have. We can but that assurance is based upon currently, am I keeping the faith? We'll talk more about this. I'm going to close this video with reading Paul's prayer in Colossians chapter 1. Since that's the first book we're going to look at. I want you to listen to this prayer and, and see what Paul prays for. And notice how much of it falls under this rubric of keeping the faith, of currently walking with the Lord. So, and by the way, you'll have an assignment in the book of Ephesians where you'll analyze Paul's prayers for the church compared to the prayers we pray today in our churches. So let's look at Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read from, well, I'm going to read from 9 to 14. Colossians 1, 9 to 14. So let's, let's go there. Colossians 1, 9 to 14. Let me scroll down here. Okay, here we go. And so... From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And he goes on, but I'm just going to stop there for now. And, and look, look at, summarize these things. Paul prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will so that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. This is directly addressing that in between time, justification and glorification. Paul's concern is, is your daily life, in light of the spiritual truths you know, in light of the good theology you've learned from me, are you walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? Paul says this on three or four occasions in his letters. We're going to see it again in Ephesians. We can live a life that's not worthy of God. Are you living worthy? He describes that then with a participle in, in Greek, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Those are two descriptions of walking worthy. Bearing fruit in every good work. We are called the good works. We're going to see that the in-between time is all about good works and increasing in the knowledge of God. Knowledge by itself makes you arrogant, but knowledge is essential to grow to maturity. Verse 11, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, 
So life is hard. We have to endure it. And then patience with joy. And lastly, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father because he's the one who qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We didn't qualify us. He did. That's part of the justification. So that's long enough for our first video. We'll have a couple of these every week that you'll have to watch along with your readings. And, and we'll also have that opportunity once a week to visit live so that we can discuss what we're learning. I'm really looking forward to this course and, and I hope this has been edifying to you today. So let's just thank the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit who guides us. Thank you for this community of believers in this class that encourage and sharpen one another. So do that today, Father. Do that as we're watching this and as we gather this week in a live session to, to be sharpened and to grow in this maturity of Christ-likeness that you've saved us for. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you next time.